Welcome everyone uh, to our Dallas Literary Festival panel, our last panel of the evening, one of two last panels of the evening. This one is called Publishing on the Fringes, Small Presses and Decentralization During COVID. Um, I'll introduce our panel, Sarah Balamban Lilar, Marketing and Sales Director at Deep Bellum and founder of Paris Space Books, who will be our moderator with Lainey Bynum, publisher of Sword and Silk Books, Meg Reed, director of Hub City Press, Tatiana Reichman, editor of Aus Pressed and author of The Ancestry of Objects, and Jessica Powers, publisher of Catalyst Press and director of editorial and foreign rights at Cinco Punto Press, and John Jeffrey, founder of In the Castle. Thank you so much for joining us and I'll hand over the panel to Sarah. Hi everybody, thank you so much for being here. Honestly, it's really exciting to see uh, everybody's name pop up as, as Lori let folks into the room. And in fact, it's really thrilling to see um, some of the Deep Vellum crew here, such as Sarah Gudarzi, whose novel we will be publishing um, in approximately a year's time, and Ron Restrepo from Houston. Hi, crew. Um, I am Sarah. I'm the marketing and, oh, hello. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I am the marketing and sales director for Deep Vellum. So I am located in Dallas, Texas, along with the Dallas Lit Festival, of course. Um, and I, as, as a small, uh, independent nonprofit press located in Dallas. We are obviously not used to having a huge number of compatriots in our city who are also doing the same kind of publishing that we are doing. So I rustled up a group along with Darius Frazier of um, other indie publishers putting in some really interesting work across the US who are not located in Brooklyn, <laughs> effectively. So um, I'm really thrilled to be here with Meg, Tatiana, Jessica, and John um, to chat about kind of what we all have in common. Um, so I think a lot of listeners might think of publishing in terms of what they're seeing on a New York Times a uh, bestseller list, what they're seeing on the very front table in a chain bookstore. Um, but while Deep Vellum is the only nonprofit literary publisher in Dallas, it's kind of a point of pride and a point of creativity, but also it comes with like its own level of frustration and struggles. Um, so my first question to, to you four is kind of a broad question, but I want to hear what you feel it means to be an independent publisher who's working outside of New York City and how is that reflected in the books that you publish? If we could start with Meg. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, so I'm Meg Reed, I'm from Hub City Press in Spartanburg, South Carolina, um, which is just about 45, 50 minutes from the North Carolina border, kind of up by Asheville. Um, and yeah, I would say that um, the place is so, like integral to everything that we do at Hub City. Um, we are a place-based publisher. Um, so we have been around for it's our 26th year and we are a literary publisher. We publish um, fiction, nonfiction and poetry and books about our region, our area. Um, and, but we only publish uh, Southern voices. In this case, our territory sort of stretches from, you know, DC to, to Texas. Um, and, uh, and so we, are dedicated just to highlighting uh, new and extraordinary Southern voices. Um, so we're the only literary press that only is dedicated to publishing inside of the region. Um, but while that sounds really sort of prescriptive and like it might be really, um, you know, small in some way, it's actually absolutely incredible the sort of range and diversity that we find in the region. It's obviously a massive region, it's like, you know, a good third of the country uh, with millions and millions of people in it. Um, and uh, so we have found that there is no shortage of stories that need to be told. Um, and often they're ones that, uh, you, you know, you talk about Brooklyn and you talk about New York, um, corp larger corporate publishers uh, favor certain kinds of stories about the South, including sort of, you know, Magnolias and Sweet Tea and, and, and um, narratives that sort of push the same people into the foreground uh, of all the stories. And so we find ourselves really at the resisting that and, um, and, a lot of our time sort of trying to reimagine and redefine what the South is, especially the modern South and the historical South, um, through differing and new perspectives and voices. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely, we could not do, we started here in Spartanburg, which is a just 
like 50, 60,000 plays in town. We're heavily, we're a nonprofit publisher. Um, um, by the people in our community. And so we could not do what we do without um, the place that we're from, absolutely. And John? So what it means to be independent publisher is the question. Um, yeah. yeah, and how that influences I guess, books you, you Yeah, the, the whole reason that I started Inside the Castle was because there was not a an existing market for the kind of work that we publish, which is um, focused on books that I guess I'd describe as books that know their books, that don't try to pretend like they're um, people having conversations or telling tales or what have you. Um, so, you know, conventional literature that you see you know, on the front table in the bookstore, like you mentioned, or um, even a lot of other larger independent presses focusing on um, novels in the, the kind of 19th century naturalist tradition. Our books focus on, um, I guess, really stylistic uh, explorations, uh, design and typographical invention, things like that that are only possible with a book and couldn't be turned into something like an audiobook um, or a podcast without significantly losing uh, a lot in the translation. And there's just not, you know, uh, there's not a large audience for that <laughs> to begin with. So <laughs> part of the reason that, that there's not a lot of people publishing this kind of work. Um, so the reason that we're independent is because we have to be and many other people, you know, would not have any interest in it. So we don't have any money. Uh, we don't take money from people and we try not to spend money um, because the kind of work that we publish has such a small audience that we can't do um, you know, things at a scale that a lot of other publishers could. So we, we try to stay very small <clears throat> um, and know our limits. So I think that's the biggest part of being independent for us is is knowing what it really means to be independent and not expecting anything from anybody else. Excellent, thank you. And Tatiana? Yeah, so um, as was mentioned, I'm with Oust. Uh, also very excited to be an author with Deep Vellum. Um, and get to get to talk to Sarah on the regular. Um, but with Oust, you know, I think our we're sort of in this in between where we are solidly an independent publisher. We are, you know, uh, sort of shoestring budget making things work, but um, maybe we just have very lofty goals. And I know in terms of the books that we end up publishing, a lot of what we think about is we want to publish work that um, maybe doesn't have a mainstream audience or um, you know a, something a little bit more experimental, a little um, unusual. Like I really love this book, uh, The Brick House by Micheline Markham, um, and you know it's a series of dreams, things like that that you might not necessarily see from from one of the big five. Uh, but I also really want to think about what we publish. Uh, it shouldn't be, you know, like weird and diversity for a niche audience that's only interested in that. I want these books to also be things that like I can give to my mother and, and she can reasonably understand and enjoy them. Uh, so we are sort of trying to walk this line in terms of accessibility for an audience, but also um, maybe an introduction to a wider audience that doesn't know that they can love and enjoy these more unusual kinds of books. And that's, that's often um, our goal in terms of what we publish. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we, we are small and independent, but we also really love the idea of, of growing in um, incremental and sustainable ways. It's wonderful. And also I'm so thrilled to First of all, make sure everybody knows that Oust is also uh, 
Texas-based in many ways and out of um, Austin, Texas, and that we often share tables at a, a Texas Book Festival, which is absolutely thrilling. And we were at the same table at AWP this past March, maybe the last literary event in person before COVID <laughs> hit, hit its stride. So, um, and then last, Jessica, if you could talk about this, I know you're doing double duty too. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so yeah, I publish African writers and African-based books at Catalyst Press, but working at Cinco Puntos, we publish primarily, I think, um, books related to the U.S.-Mexico border. And of course, we're located in all Paso, so um, we also publish a lot of Native American writers and um, multicultural books, generally speaking, but really with a strong focus on um, Latino and Native American writers. Um, but at Catalyst, I publish African writers. I, for me, I think uh, being an independent um, publisher just means <laughs> always struggling to pay the bills. So, um, <laughs> um, and I think probably everybody on the panel can relate to that. Um, and yeah, I think being outside of New York is helpful uh, in big ways um, for us at Cinco Puntos, you know, being in El Paso, this has formed and shaped the kinds of books that we publish in um, ways that if we were anywhere else, we just wouldn't publish the books that we publish. And for me at Catalyst, I think having a strong connection to the continent and traveling there regularly has been important. I probably could do that from Brooklyn, but um, it would just make my life a lot more expensive. So. Absolutely. <laughs> and I think something too that that is so interesting about um, uh, being kind of small and independent and not in New York is like the forms that our books take are all so special and so specific. And, you know, doing smaller print runs has, has um, made it possible for us to kind of take more creative measures with um, how we present these amazing authors to the public. I mean, I think at Deep Vellum, many of our books are fairly niche and many are not. And I think have huge, huge appeal. Um, and so we can kind of, again, straddle these worlds uh, and really try to reach folks in creative and original ways um, and work really hard doing it. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's a great joy to me. And I think that's what shaped uh, my desire to talk to you all about this is just the fact that you're all doing such amazing things that are so place-based. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to kind of piggyback on something you said, because I think you touched on something really important, which is that um, being smaller allows us to take more risks. And sometimes that's in terms of like the packaging, you know, like that foil stamp on the book I just showed, um, you know, that's something that it, we couldn't do for thousands and thousands of copies. But uh, for a small run, you can you can make those choices, but also with the content like we can take risks on books that are good enough to be published by a top five. They just can't afford to take the risk on, on such an unusual work, you know, and I don't suspect that that's unique to oust, but I just thought that was an interesting point that you, you brought up. Right. And I think too, I mean, giving, giving folks and giving authors kind of a, a hand in the creative process. I mean, it was such a joy to work with you, for example, Tatiana, um, on getting this book to look the way we wanted it to look and have fabulous designers do the cover for your book, The Ancestry of Objects. It's such a joy. I mean, I feel that it may be in a bigger publishing house, I wouldn't have the um, agency that I have and perhaps authors wouldn't as well. So it's a lot of fun. Sure going to add to that just quickly yeah. I'm a book designer and I do design at Hub City or at least half of it and um, that was really important to me when I became director I said like I still want to be a book designer because I can't imagine giving up people are like you think it's funny and that's the kind of weird double jobs that you get I know two dollar radio has this too where you have people that are you know running back in and doing like inventory and books and stuff like the, the, the accounting but they're also like having input or designing the covers. And in a corporate publisher, these two people would never speak to each other or probably almost never meet. Um, and so my the joy that comes from my job, I think, is like getting a Word document and thinking about how it's going to look and actually ha being able to Im have input or design the cover with 
the, with the author. Um, and like getting cut off from that process would be like a huge loss to me because now I feel like I'm ruined for it. Like I just, you know, so anyway, I, I feel very spoiled by that. Like it's a lot of work, but it's also hugely collaborative and for us and for the authors in a way that um, I don't, you know, it just doesn't exist at bigger places. So. Right. And it's so, I find that so interesting, the ways in which we're able to kind of e use the um, uh, small size of our groups to make this happen. So I actually do want to talk to you all about um, how how your publishers are set up. Um, have I know, for example, Deep Vellum had a kind of a little bit more traditional office space prior to COVID where we were uh, working in an open open concept office with our bookstore in front. Um, and now of course we're all remote and working from our, our hastily designed home offices. Um, but I'm curious to hear about how y'all's like location may have changed in the past year, if it has, um, and how that's affected like workflow and communication for everybody. Uh, I, can, I can start. Yeah, I, I can go ahead. Um, sure. I I don't have any colleagues or <laughs> anything. I do, I do everything by myself. So um, I review submissions, uh, do all financial stuff, pay royalties, do book designs, do mailing, bookstore communications, everything by myself. Um, so this has not been a change. Perhaps my, my contribution to small publishing in a time of COVID is that nothing changes <laughs> during a pandemic when you do everything by yourself. Um, is it fun? No, uh, I've talked to other you know, people who are maybe in, in my peer group of uh, the, the size of publishers that, that I am and they have you know, people who help them with design or things like that. But I think because Inside the Castle is focused on a particular aesthetic understanding of what a book is and can be that it's been challenging for me to involve other people so far. Uh, so I, I don't know. Uh, Nothing has changed for me, I guess, is, is the biggest way to, to put that. Kind of lovely in a way. It's kind of calming to hear that somebody else's flow hasn't been completely disrupted. Well, the rest of my life, you know, <laughs> I have a I have a two-year-old and I teach at a university. Okay. So uh, the rest of my life, you know, at least I have this that I have control over because the rest of it, all bets are off. I'll go to Sarah. My life actually hasn't changed all that much either because I was already working at home. Um, I do have somebody who works for me from Brooklyn um, and does publicity. And then I have an office manager in Cape Town who manages, um, you know, helps me with submissions and also helps with the uh, African side of things um, and deals with my distributor there. And so we just right on going. I think things changed a little bit more for Cinco Puntos. Um, not for me again, because I was already working from home, but um, certainly the Cinco Puntos office kind of shut down. Um, even right now, people are going into the office, but um, are in completely different rooms and not mm -hmm. you know, and wearing masks and those that are going into the office. So, I, But they're still going into the office, which... Um, maybe as a surprise to people, but yeah. Yeah, we're back. Um, South Carolina has been open like for almost the entire time. Um, but we, uh, so I mean like South Carolina is kind of a state where you have to kind of make your own boundaries for things um, and not rely on the state so much to guide you. Um, but we actually opened a, in a full service independent bookstore in 2010 um, and it's quite large. It's in a Masonic, Temple, Stone Masonic Temple, and we worked out of the back of it because um, there were there's just two of us on staff, and then we have a range of people that work freelance. Um, and so we actually 
a crazy coincidence is that we got the keys to an office to move Hub City out of press, as, out of the bookshop on March 15th, which is like the day the world fell apart. So the, we got this new space and then it was like, okay, we're going home now. And so over the course of the next few months, I went from home and renovated a brand new office that had been empty for three years. So we went back to this brand new office, me and my um, assistant director and it was like hermetically sealed like it hadn't been you know no one else had been in it so um now we work out of that it's about a thousand square feet for two people and um it, it's been great um having the, the office space but it was very weird timing it was like you know um we made this big break at the same time um the world was undergoing this huge change so it's it was it was very weird um and but it ended up being sort of a blessing because it was a place we could close the door and not have the public and not have to deal with us public space being shut down and everything, so. Right, and out of curiosity, what are the next steps for the bookstore as well? What is that kind of, how is that, how is that functioning? Uh, we are, the bookstore is open and we just keep it to five people and masks. Um, and we've done that since uh, for the last like couple of months and, um, and it has been okay. Um, it's been a little self-regulating uh, because obviously but traffic is hugely down um, in bookstores. So uh, it hasn't been a big problem to keep the, the, the crowds out. <laughs> no hordes of people trying to get into this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I guess I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, so I was in Austin where where most of our, our group is based and um, we all, because you know, we don't have an office space. We're all sort of working on it on our own. In addition to our our day jobs, um, we would, you know, maybe meet for dinner once a month and kind of talk about like what we're working on, make sure everybody's on the same page, go over deadlines, stuff like that. But um, so we were sort of already accustomed to working independently, even though it's not just one person like John. Um, you know, there are multiple of us, but we are already kind of working from home. So that part didn't change so much. Um, when I moved to Louisville uh, about two years ago, that that was sort of a a shift because we couldn't have those, you know, those dinners and kind of all be in one place. But um, it has sort of uh, invited an opportunity to sort of start thinking about who else can be on the team and and what we need and um, engaging other people and. Uh, it's, it's allowed us to think outside of Austin, which um, in, in a way can be good. Um, so it's been, yeah, uh, as John said, uh, the, you know, every, everything <laughs> about life is in a shambles, but this part is actually fairly consistent. <laughs> that's so funny. I, I think that's just remarkable because I don't mean to make light of like the rest of our lives all being absolute madness by saying, oh, how lovely to have this reliability. But it's so funny. I will admit to be, you know, I'm at Steep Vellum, like we were, we were one wall away from a bookstore. So it's the similar sense of like being quite right next to the buzz of, of the Dallas public. Um, being able to meet all of these individuals who maybe have never heard of Deep Vellum before, maybe have never really heard of independent publishers before, and they don't really know what that means. I think many people don't. Um, and so to go from that and the sort of regular, uh, regular communication and conversation to like the box is so funny for me. I admit I'm not used to it yet. It's very unusual for me. And I think as, as, in part of my job being an events coordinator, I've also had to kind of rebuild, I had to rebuild my year's goals and missions in 2020, um, kind of from the ground up. We had author tours that were of course like immediately canceled. We had uh, so many events that our authors were doing that were just kind of across the country that were nixed. Um, and so I, I keep thinking Meg about this last, event that Deep Vellum did in collaboration with other publishers, including Hub City at the Association of Writers and Writing Conferences, I think that's it, panel in 2020. Um, and this glorious old building in San Antonio with quite a lovely crowd. And just having that be sort of this last moment of like fake normalcy <laughs> before having to book all of these things virtually. So I'm curious to hear from y'all 
Um, I think starting with Meg, because you are working with a bookstore and because you are working with this writer's project and workshops as well, how are you approaching readers in the last year, um, whether it is through events or just other virtual outreach? Yeah, we definitely, um, I would say like the most terrifying week was like March 15th, where um, we had a book coming out in April and that um, we ended up moving back to May. Um, and uh, I suddenly was thinking about like, how are we going to sell books if the stores are closed and the libraries are closed? And the, and it was almost, it was just, it was such a weird thing. because It wasn't like a problem that I could really figure out a work around. It was like, I think we just have to stop for a second, you know? And um so we had kind of a pause on promoting books and um, that turned out to be a kind of good thing because I think it caused us to really think, I think that at the heart of most independent publishers is some form of literary community, community building, and, you know, and um, it, it, I think we all kind of restored, here, we all refocused on that a little bit and it was like, okay, let's do you know, uh, Instagram lives and like show people the office space and like talk to them and ask them to do like AMAs about publishing. And, um, and then we uh, canceled our workshop programming, which we also do extensively at our conference and we replan them for uh, virtual. Um, but, you know, we, that, was, that was kind of an expected thing to do. We planned all our events and everything. But it, def, what surprised me more was, um, you know, I got my kind of older boomer um, colleagues on Instagram Live for the first time answering questions and people loved it because everybody was so locked down and people were so kind of looking for community and and I do think of that time as sort of a really um, special thing you know where we had a, a ability to actually talk to people directly instead of being like hello let me sell you this book it was like okay let's all just kind of like talk about books as a way of getting through this and the store which I don't have anything to do with except for being in you know often enough um, but they started doing a lot of like book recommendation videos and all this kind of stuff that they should have been doing all along, but they were very busy and, you know, didn't get to. And so I think um, in a lot of ways, it re it did kind of like refocus the people that we were we were reaching um, more directly, whether that's people, writers that in our workshops and conferences or the people that read our books. Um, it, it When all the the kind of um, promotional stuff went away. It was like, okay, what do, we, how do we actually reach people? And that ended up being some more like direct sort of um, social media and things like that, um, you know, and, and, and we're still trying to figure it out, honestly. I mean, up till right now, but, um, but yeah, it's definitely, um, I would say we kind of leaned on community building um, because that's all we could do, virtual community building. I'll speak next, I guess. Ironically, um, the pandemic opened up opportunities for my authors because they're all in on the continent of Africa and we can never afford to bring them over anyway. And with virtual events happening and bookstores being open to that, and um, we actually did start um, booking some authors into events that we never would have been able to before. So. Um, it, it actually opened up things for us in ways that I hope continues. And I hope that booksellers and others continue to be open to those opportunities and those types of events, even when they're going back to live events, because, you know, um, not everybody can travel. Yeah, truly, it's been huge. I mean, so many of Deep Vellum's authors are international and are published by us in translation. And it's been so similarly interesting to see who is, kind of up for these weird virtual events, um, whatever level of success they may be. I feel like there was this period in sort of like March and April and early May where all our heads were down and we were working to figure out what the heck to do. And there was this level of creativity that was so amazing to see. And just the sort of collaborative brainstorming happening between publishers, indie publishers, I absolutely adored it. I will admit like, I definitely romanticize that first month of chatting with all of these other amazing folks in our field who are just folks who love books and are interested in sharing uh, what they're working on and, and sharing that with the public. Anyway, just me blathering on about being excited about it all. <laughs> John, I'm curious to hear because comparatively, um, this is, you are the marketing department and the editorial, and I'm curious to hear about your process of reaching readers 
and honestly, like whether that's changed and, and what that looks like for you. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm terrible <laughs> at it. Uh, I'm not a good promoter. I, sometimes I feel pretty bad for people who uh, whose books I publish <laughs> because I'm not. I, I think they know what they're getting into though. Um, sometimes they don't, but I think they, they grow to understand the, the culture of what I'm doing. Um, I think the, the biggest thing that has been helpful or, or satisfying to me in the last year was um, early on in the pandemic, like the, that kind of what are we gonna do period you were talking about. Um, I was talking with a lot of the authors that I've published and, and we decided we would make eBooks of all of our work, which because our books are so focused on the experience of holding a paper book and what that means, the eBook or the idea of the eBook has always kind of been not present in our practice. So everybody whose book I published or books I've published, we have 30 books um, and you know, a couple dozen and a half authors, every single one of them said, yes, I will make my, a PDF of my book available for free. Um, so we made a, a library of PDFs for people to access of all of our books for lockdown, you know, so that people could, you know, have something to do since they weren't going to bookstores or whatever, not that we have a bunch of presents in bookstores, but just making a gesture to people to say, hey, we want to be, you know, aware of your isolation. And then uh, after George Floyd was murdered and, uh, you know, shortly after that, we, I talked to the, the authors again and we figured out that perhaps it would be a new thing to do to make all of this library of PDFs available for a donation. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we redirected that effort and now have a $15 donation that people can make <clears throat> and then get access to every single one of our books and then 100% of that donation goes to Black Lives Matter activism all around the country. And we've raised a tremendous amount of money. And for me, you know, doing all of this by myself, not having any backup or anything, I've always done it because I don't know what else to do with myself. And I love it. And it makes me, you know, feel like I'm productive. I've never taken any money from it at all. Um, and I never wanted to, but being able to give this money to a cause that I feel really passionate about that is, you know, banked on all of the thousands of hours that I've put in over the last several years has made it you know, much more meaningful to me. So mm -hmm. I don't know that we're reaching a lot more people, but I think that the, the context of what my mission is has changed a bit because of yeah the virtual status of things. Right. And lastly, before we go into Q&A, Tatiana. Yeah, so um, I, I do want to reiterate what a couple of other people have said, just that uh, there are almost more opportunities available because, because things are virtual. But I also think, um, you know, we just put out a book uh, this month and uh, it's a new author, and I think they are very, very eager to, you know, do promotion, which I totally understand. I've, I've been there. Sarah's gotten those emails, uh, <laughs> but you know, everybody's just like looking for opportunities to, to promote the work. And I think there's this is sort of aligning with some Zoom fatigue, and um, which makes it pretty tough. And so I, I. I think we're sort of, we were so creative in finding new ways to promote books and now we're reaching this point where we have to pivot or continue to reinvent and um, continue to engage. And I, I think what has made the most sense, um, you know, for me and for, for our authors who are coming out is to talk about really diversifying the ways that we promote, um, you know, like 
maybe we're not doing in-person events yet. Maybe we're hoping that we can in the not too, too distant future, but like we'll also throw in maybe like a virtual launch and try to have like a big event now. Um, but then also like one of the best things you can do to keep promoting that work is to publish other pieces other places and so um, just trying to help folks look for other opportunities um, and to stay on our toes and to continue to be creative and um, you know I, I'm so lucky that uh, we have Phoebe Walter on, on staff who is so good at these things and and she just tells me what we're doing um, <laughs> And I, I don't have to think about it too hard, but um, I, I do know that that's something that we've seen kind of shift throughout the pandemic. At the very beginning, there was we had a new book come out at AWP, and that author was able to shift a lot of those events because that's right when everybody was like, "Oh, let's like make it virtual," and you know everybody's stuck at home, and we think it's going to be two weeks of this. <laughs> um, and now the feeling's a little bit different about looking at the computer. <laughs> But, but I'm so glad everyone's here, all the people who are. Thank you to everybody for participating in one of these kind of creative iterations of, of Book Talk. <laughs> and we were so thrilled um, last fall to have an event with Tatiana for the Ancestry of Objects. That was a one night only personalized reading um, series over the phone. So we were able to connect her with um, readers who would call in and get a personalized two or three minute kind of clip from the book. And it was so much fun to see all of these phone calls coming in. <laughs> so, okay, I'm, I'm chatting too much. We need to get to Q&A. So we have some fabulous questions from folks in the audience. So I'll go ahead and read those aloud. And then whoever would like to answer, please feel free. So I would love uh, for panelists to discuss the significance of their press names from Marion. Significance of the name of your press. I can go super quick. Um, there, oh, sorry. There's a um, there's like eight hub cities across the um, or like a million. I don't even know how many there are. Um, it just means that you're a hub of railroad business. And for us, Spartanburg was a hub in South Carolina of railroad business in the 19th century. And uh, when Hub City Press was founded, um, it was a really dark time in the 90s after the sort of industry had fallen apart and the town was um, really depressed. And so it was a it was a hearkening back to a time where we had been very successful and people were proud to be from here. And that was intentional. And then we're also the Hub City Writers Project, uh, which is named after the Federal Federal Writers Project. Um, so that's, that's us. And we're not Hubcap. I we always get Hubcap press. So anyway, <laughs> that's the, the other thing people misremember it as. So. Yeah, I, um, I remember having a dinner with Wendy, the publisher, at Mr. Natural, I think on uh, South Congress about what to name the press. And uh, she was sort of adamant about the kind of name she did not want to have. Um, but one of the things that got kicked around was, you know, what do we want the press to be and um, sort of our philosophy and also our um, aesthetic. And we were thinking about the word august and just being uh, sort of respectable and um, upstanding. And oust is Welsh for august and, and we kind of like the sound. It sounded a little bit like Austin. Um, and so it, it kind of stuck for that reason. Uh, well, inside the castle is, <clears throat> um, it's kind of a play off of Kafka's novel, The Castle. Um, I had this feeling uh, reading the book many times that the castle was not actually a place in the novel, but a, you know, just the idea of bureaucracy itself. Anyway, I'm not gonna examine the book, but the idea of inside the castle is that being inside the castle is no different than being anywhere else and our expectation of books is that they typically transport you to somewhere else. And my interest in books is that they exist in our world as objects that are no different than a chair or the grain of fabric on your lap when you set the book down. Um, so 
<clears throat> the idea is that the inside of the book is no different than the rest of the world. Uh, it just is kind of encoded in such a way that you look at it slightly differently and it has different advantages than looking at the grain of wood on a table or something. But at, at some point, they all kind of flatten out. And our goal is, is for the books themselves to kind of invest in their objectness in such a way that they, they tend to, to be looked at differently than you would a normal piece of writing in a book. Um, so I'll conclude. Um, I <laughs> Catalyst Press, I named it. Um, I was trying to think about books as a force for change in the world. And so um, Catalyst came kind of naturally as the you know, word to describe um, the effect that I want my books to have. Um, and Cinco Puntos at the neighborhood in El Paso, Five Points neighborhood. And uh, so the press quite literally started in Five Points neighborhood. And so that's how the press got its name. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I am always so curious about this because um, as I'm not the founder of Deep Vellum, but somebody who's absolutely uh, kind of interested in the formation of the publisher. We are kind of based around the Deep Ellum neighborhood um, in Dallas and it's a, it's a total pun on the name with vellum paper material and people always uh, ask what's what the pun is and and it's it's a lot of fun to kind of describe it to people and describe the origins. Um, um, so especially as small publishers with often very limited staffing, uh, Ram asks, how often do indie publishers outsource uh, in the book creation process? By that, I'm assuming you kind of mean, you know, do we use outside editors, outside graphic designers, etc.? And I'd say, you know, for me, I definitely have um, both a you know regular cover designer who designs our covers. Um, she's based in um, South Africa, and then a graphic um, designer that does the interiors. And she's in Louisiana, and they're both you know contract workers. Um, but in terms of the editorial, um, I pretty much do that in house. So. Yeah, we have some variation on uh, on that as well. Um, editorial is pretty much me. Uh, Phoebe, who I mentioned earlier, has uh, stepped up as assistant editor, so I am getting some some help from her. Uh, we have our artistic director, LK James, is uh, a real star um, and a gem. She does our <clears throat> interior and and covers, um, but she, you know, because we're all doing this part-time, you know, she does a lot of uh, freelance cover design work and layout work for a lot of folks. And uh, we recently have started uh, hiring out for a copy editor, um, David McNamara, who runs Publish Publish. He also runs Sunny Outside Press, um, where I've, you know, helped them out with stuff. And, and so, you know, I think independent publishing is a, it's a small gene pool. Uh, <laughs> sharing, sharing a lot. Um, so, you know, he, he's somebody we're very familiar with, but uh, we have been contracting him. He's also a um, print broker. So he helps us, um, you know, find, find the best pay, place to get books printed. So. He's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, we, we do, um, like I said, we have a two person staff. And I do all production management and sort of getting the books shepherded through. We do a lot of editorial in house. Um, actually, a COVID related thing is that we brought on two contract editors um, part time um, and it's been fantastic. I don't know if we'll move forward with two or we'll go down to one. Um, who can who can do both like all just prose because we have a fiction and nonfiction right now and they're busy at different times. I don't know if it could be one super talented person. We'll just kind of judge that. Um, and as I said, I do book design, but that often means I art direct. Um, so I, I work with other designers, or if I, I'm not an illustrator, I can't draw at all. So I um, contract with other um, illustrators to, to do things that I can't possibly do. If I read a book and I'm like, this has to be this kind of illustration, then I go find that person and I, and I um, direct them in the art creation process. 
Um, and then we use contract publicity. Um, we use contract copy editors. So yeah, we have a full, I would say I work with six to eight people in contract or um, either contract or just kind of like constant um, freelance um, capacity. So that's a, that's a huge part of, um, of my job. Um, and uh, I also am a freelance book designer and I work with a lot of other presses as a freelance book designer. Um, so I know uh, uh, what, how I like to be managed as a freelancer, which helps. Um, and uh, sometimes I'm a worse freelancer to the people I work for. And then I'm like, oh God, if people did this to me, I'd be so upset. <laughs> so I try to be a better freelancer. Oh, drinks a water. So, yeah, um, but yeah, we, we have a pretty, uh, pretty robust group of people outside that, that we work with. Excellent. Uh, there's probably not a lot of mystery about what I'm about to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, I have I have a, a, a maybe a change of pace. Uh, some of the writers that I work with the the aesthetic of their book is really inextricable from the piece of writing itself. Um, I grabbed a couple of books. Uh, this one is a book by M. Kitchell. He's a, a writer in San Francisco. Um, and his his writing is really like, he cannot conceive of how you read his writing without the graphic design and layout and everything associated with it. So. I, I trust him for one to do his own work, um, but also it's it's not possible to look at his writing or read his writing without it being in the form that he expects. Um, this one is a book called Lonely Men Club by Mike Klein. And similarly, it's got um, a lot going on in terms of the way the text looks. One of the reasons that this was not done by me is that I run a, I call it a remote residency every year called the Castle Freak Remote Residency. And uh, we take proposals for people to do um, a residency of five days in which they use um, computer or AI assistance to write a hundred thousand word book. So this was written in five days um, and I had nothing to do with it. Uh, I didn't edit it. I didn't you know, do any of the design at all. So it was kind of separate for me. Our, our typical, the rest of the books, you know, I do that all by myself, um, but there are cases where the writer needs to take it on themselves, whether it's because it's part of the process or because they want to have some kind of control over the, the presentation. Right. Oh, that's so cool. Um, somebody else has, Lou has asked, do these publishers offer workshops for aspiring writers? And so I think in kind of a roundabout way, Meg and John, y'all have kind of answered, uh, if you do, and if so, like what kinds? <laughs> John, obviously it's not workshops for aspiring writers, but instead it's wild and cool residency. Yeah, I will just throw out there that I, I do not because I don't need another thing to do, but another small press that um, I would say is a, a friend of ours uh, called 1111, like, you know, when the time hits 1111, you make a wish, they're named after that. Um, they have been running a series of virtual workshops um, as winter turns to spring this year that I think have been really um effective and I've heard a lot of people you know have produced great work through that so if, if you're interested you could check google 1111 press and and they they have been doing some workshops wonderful yeah that's been one of the most exciting things for us moving those to virtual because we get signups from all across the country and we use we try to pull off of a talent pool that's mostly southerners um because of the mission and so it means that uh, a larger group of people are being exposed to these really, really super talented writers. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we've done, uh, we did uh, one with Gabino Iglesias on putting violence. Um, and uh, we did, uh, we have one coming up about writing about home when you're stuck in it, essentially. Um, and so, yeah, we do, um, we don't do straight, usually like how, you know, how to write a novel, how to start your novel, like kind of more like catapulty kind of like multiple session. We kind of do one off odd workshops um, and usually they kind of sell on the fact that they're a little weird um, so we always ask for ideas from the from the writers and we're like if you have a weird one that you love teaching like tell us about it because probably people will love attending it too <laughs> so yep 
so cool. So yeah, if you like an organization, they're probably doing online workshops. And even if you're far away from them, you can take them. Which is great. Okay, I have, uh, we have 10 minutes left. Tatiana, did you want to ask anything before I launch the next question? Sorry. No, I was just going to follow that up with um, mentioning that I was actually started in a workshop that I was teaching through UT and that was where I met Wendy and we originally were on the Austin Review. So that's sort of like our genesis and we've talked about starting uh, writers workshops. Um, but as John mentioned, like I haven't yet motivated myself to or orchestrate another thing um, and create more work, but uh, it's definitely something that we've we've thought about and is sort of in our in our DNA a little bit theme of the indie publisher is many hats and little time. <laughs> okay, uh, real uh, up next here from Ron. Um, what criteria do you use to select what you want to publish? Obviously, geography has a lot to do with it, for example, with Meg and often with Deep Vellum as well as we're trying to integrate uh, regional writers from Texas. Um, but what other criteria do you use? I publish what I like. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah, I would reiterate or um, yeah, so jump on that. Uh, I And sometimes what I like changes and I'll even read something and think, oh man, if I read this like three years ago, I would have, you know, but um, it, it's evolving and it also sometimes depends on okay, I know these are our next four books. And so we've sort of covered some of this territory. Sometimes you get a book in and you're like, oh, this is really great, but we actually have something similar coming out. So um, probably gonna pass on it this time, but uh, sometimes it's just something's in the air, you know? Um, and we also don't, uh, aren't often open for submissions. It's frequently by solicitation. So I might be talking to an author who I think's uh, does something particularly well. And I think, you know, I would really love for you to write a book length essay on uh, like nature and mysticism. Go, you know, and let's see, let's see what comes with of, of that. Um, and so far it's worked pretty well. <laughs> um, we are open for submissions twice a year. And it's one of those things that I really like that we do, even though it's kind of um, a massive undertaking because we get a lot and um, it's part of our sort of foundational it's like democratic process in that in the south there aren't as many um, structures for writers to survive um, there isn't as much academy there isn't as much um, you know small arts organizations they can work for um, because we don't have the arts um, uh, support and sort of uh, we do have you know our commissions and things like that but they're smaller and so a lot of the people we publish are have jobs and work as teachers and they're librarians and urban planners and um, we don't just publish professors and so um, and that's just the nature of where we are and where we're coming from so in order to accommodate that and sort of reduce the level of gatekeeping we um, do open for submissions twice a year and we get hundreds and we publish probably one book every year or two from that from that pile um, and uh, I always say that, you know, the best thing for me is a book I like, uh, we're literary, so a book that's extremely well written um, and, you know, favors language and thought over um, construction of plot or, or any, you know, kind of more genre things. But I also like a book that sort of knows its place in the, in, in the marketplace, understands what it's doing, um, an author that understands, I work with agents a lot too, kind of, you know, a book that says, you might think this about this place. Uh, but here's why this my book is going to make you think differently about it or whatever. Um, I like to feel that sort of like why the book is necessary essentially for being with you really excited. Um, up until last year, we've been open for submissions con continuously. Um, as Meg noted, that's <laughs> it's not especially sustainable. Um, uh, and so this year we switched to a three month, two or three month reading period at the beginning of the year that we've just wrapped up. Um, and I feel like that will help me, uh, as a psychologically, um, but yeah, so we, we actually, 
have not really solicited anything. Every, everything has come through <clears throat> the open reading process. Um, I think my, my selection criteria has a lot to do with what seems like it will work with the, the mission of the press. It has a, a very narrow uh, aperture of work that it's looking for. Um, and a lot of the stuff that I read, I think is incredible, but it doesn't really fit. Um, I think, you know, a lot of times when a, a writer probably gets back a, a rejection that says that they don't believe it, but <laughs> people, should, people should believe it. I mean, I think that's probably the case with every publisher. Um, I think beyond that, uh, the kind of work that I'm publishing, I think is most frequently identified with white men like me. And so <clears throat> one of my goals has been to um, not out outwardly solicit or tokenize uh, other kinds of voices, but to um, gravitate towards publishing uh, right. people who are not straight white men. Um, and I, I have felt really excited about a lot of the different approaches to writing um, the type of work that I'm looking for that are, are not based in that, that kind of voice. So it's not a, a, a highly public selection criteria of mine, but it's something that is really important to me when I'm looking at people's work. Okay, I'm going to ask one more question and then we should definitely close for the evening. Um, before I ask, I really want to say thank you so much to the four of you for being a part of this and chatting with me and, and being a part of the Dallas Literary Festival, which continues through the end of tomorrow. Um, amazingly, with tons and tons of different events going on. Uh, so one last question here, uh, Yolanda asks, what do each of the small presses consider their greatest achievement since their inception? No pressure. I would like to say Deep Villain's greatest achievement was hiring me. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I think for, for me, just quickly, it's having been able to do this for seven years and publish 30 books and still still be doing it. Uh, every single book, every single book I've published, I just am so proud of and in love with. I grabbed another one just to show you more stuff. This one's called Smut Maker. Uh, and every single spread is different color. I've typed that every single piece of text and drew all of these things that go in the book. So like every single book for me, just to be able to bring it into the world, I don't care if anybody buys it or for the sake of the author, I hope people do, but just to make it part of this world is just, it feels like a special accomplishment. Yeah, well, I just want to mention that uh, for a one man show printed, uh, Publishing 30 books in seven years is uh, super impressive. <laughs> I am I, I'm in awe. Um, I think for Oust, um, it, we started with chat books and we did that really intentionally as a, we, we had this curator series where we would, you know, approach somebody and say, who are four people we need to read, right? Like, I know there's something a little bit exclusionary about doing, um, works only by solicitation, but also I don't have the bandwidth as one person that John clearly does to, to read open submissions year round. So um, that was our approach. And we would get these uh, four chaplain chapbook length manuscripts from our curator and produce these chapbooks and taught us about layout, design, uh, sort of that editorial relationship. But also we found authors through that process that we were like, okay, we want to work on a full length book with you. Um, and so that transition from chapbooks to full lengths, which was a couple of years ago, was a really big, very intentional step for us. And um, I think it's, that, that might be the moment that I, that I turn to. And I also just want to generally say thank you, Sarah, and um, to the festival and everything for, for having us. It's been, a, it's been a pleasure. Thank you.
It's so much fun to see you. <laughs> oh no, Meg, I don't know if you are. Um, I, can't, I, I personally can't hear you. Lori, can you? I can't either. Okay. I can't hear you either. Sorry. I'll go then. Um, you know, I, I think I don't. I think it's really hard to talk about your most um, your biggest accomplishment. But I think I really am proud of the fact that I've been able to bring some children's literature over from Africa and um, kind of enter into that global literature space. I think children's literature in the United States is dominated by American voices and American authors, and um, and to be able to you know introduce something new into the mix is exciting. And thanks, Sarah, for organizing the panel. I oh. hope to see you at the next sales conference. <laughs> I hope to see you in person at the next sales conference. I miss y'all's faces so much. The listeners and viewers of this event just know that I adore seeing these people in person. And so I'm, I'm like, come on, get us back in the same room, please. <laughs> um, is that working better now? Yes. yes. I think my earbuds said. Um, so uh, yeah, I was gonna say, I wish I could say that it was like one day, like October 22nd was the best day that we've ever had or something like that. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was a great day. Um, and, uh, but I think um, it sounds really, it doesn't really try, but I think the last year has been something I'm immensely proud of. And it was um, a little bit like just mentally getting out of my own way. I had such a, I was so nervous. I was going to let my authors down for the two previous years I've been doing this as director and something about the pandemic just sort of like cut that loose and I was you know I think it was so uncontrolled and like you know what can I possibly do I'm just one person whatever and uh, we had a, a book coming out that um, was set in rural um, Ohio and it was about the the um, AIDS epidemic and a really personal story and what I believed was a, a, a huge important book and there, like I said a month before I thought you know no one's ever going to read this book because um there's a pandemic happening. And uh, it was such a sad, awful feeling to know that we had put so much work and I had so much belief in this book. And um, and then what ended up happening was like nothing short of a miracle in my eyes. It was that it was, you know, written up and acclaimed and won a bunch of awards. And it has been, and it's so deserved by the author. Um, and so it it was it was that actual feeling of like you know, important books do find their homes and they find their readers and there's a reason that we do this. And I think it was like the biggest stress test of that notion, um, just knowing how much unfairness and inequality and inequity is built into this industry and everything. Um, you know, it, at that moment, I, I, I thought, you know, they're all just gonna be remaindered in a, in a, in a garbage bin after. And, it just, and the fact that that didn't happen and that, um, you know, it, it made me realize that small presses are, can be incredibly powerful because they are so author focused and they are so um, boutique and, and, and just doing something that corporate publishers aren't doing. And, uh, and that's why we continue to do it because that's just an immensely powerful, wonderful thing. So um, I think that's true for all of you. And uh, I'm so happy to have been able to chat with all of you tonight. Was, thank you, Sarah, for putting this together. Oh, happily. Um, I would love to answer this question really, really quickly as well um, from Deep Vellum. Um, and I, I mean, honestly, it's similar to what y'all are saying in that I am incredibly proud of this past year um, in terms of Deep Vellum, not in general. <laughs> well, I'm, in, I'm proud of our, our growth and I'm proud that we've begun to include a lot of books from US authors, non-translated authors, such as Tatiana Reichman's book, such as Fozia Karimi's book, Above Us the Milky Way, poetry from Mike Soto, who is a Dallas-based poet now in New York. Um, we're incorporating children's books uh, this summer. Uh, we have a trilingual children's book coming out. And it's just so fabulous to <clears throat> see the power of independent presses as we work to grow and shift what what the book world looks like and what readers can pick up off the shelves. And to the readers out there, I really recommend that you go to your local independent bookstore and you ask the booksellers, what's a book from an independent press that you think I would like that you've never heard of before, that I've never heard of before, pardon. And just see their faces light up in a way, you know, because every bookseller wants to be asked that question. What's your favorite that's brand new to me? So 
that's my that's my parting action to y'all. Um, thank you so much for attending. Meg, John, Jessica, Tatiana, thank you for your time and energy and your brains. I'm very grateful and for y'all. Thank you, Sarah, for moderating this panel for the Dallas Literary Festival. We've had such a good time. And thank you to everyone who attended. And we hope you'll join us tomorrow starting at 10 a.m. for a whole new set of wonderful panels. Thank you so much. <laughs>